Um, may I welcome you on behalf of the London Mathematical Society to the second virtual ICM public lecture on black holes and mathematical enlightenment. We are doing this from the recording that Eleanor Giorgio has uh, given us of, Cambridge, of Columbia University has sent us. Eleanor is actually here to answer questions. So the recording is there in case of bandwidth problems. Please note that this session is being recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the camera, on the recording, please turn your camera off. And may I ask you to remain muted throughout the um, talk. Eleanor is an assistant professor at Columbia University. Prior to this, she was a postdoctoral research assistant at the Gravity Institute at Princeton University and received her PhD in mathematics at Columbia University in 2019. Her field of research is general relativity and hyperbolic PDEs. And if you have any questions during the talk, please put them in the chat box. There will be time for a Q&A at the end of the talk and questions should be put in the chat. And may I now hand over to Eleanor and Anna for the recording. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will introduce you to fascinating astrophysical objects called black holes. And I will do my best to explain how mathematics has helped shed light on them from their very first conception, actually, up to more recent problems and conjectures in the field. And just like in this animated uh, simulation that you can see here in this slide of a black hole with a galaxy passing behind it, mathematics has more than once passed through the study of black holes and has enlightened them, as you can see here. But let's see, let's see why and how. Well, astrophysics is the science that studies the outer space. And all the various celestial bodies in it, such as you know, stars, galaxies, like the ones that is, that, that is um, depicted here in this image by the uh, Hubble Space Telescope that was obtained in 1995. Well, among these many bodies uh, in outer space, we now know that there are also mysterious objects called black holes. And even though you may have heard a lot about them, about these this black holes, well, maybe you, you may not know that it's actually only very recently that we have direct and indirect proofs of their existence. And now I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain and, and show you some of them. Well, the first indirect observation of, of black holes was through the detection of gravitational waves by the LIGO interferometers in the United States, in, in Washington and Louisiana in 2015. So that was the first detection. And that detection actually resulted in the awarding of the Nobel Prize in Physics 2017 to these three gentlemen, Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne. And um, what happened, uh, as you see, the mention, the mention of, the, of the Nobel Committee is for their decisive contribution to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. And what happened is that on the 14th of September 2015, the, uh, the universe gravitational waves were observed for the very first time by, by the, the LIGO interferometers after being predicted by Albert Einstein and its theory of general relativity precisely 100 years before, 1915. And these gravitational waves, well, they came from uh, a collision between two black holes, which were actually much more massive than the sun, like both of them. So they that collided, they became one larger black hole. And this happened 1.3 billion light years away. So this is the time the light took to reach uh, our in interferometers in, in, uh, in, in the United States. So this is a simulation by the Simulating Extreme Space Time or XXX project of the astrophysical event that was observed by LIGO. Well, here you can see two objects that look quite literally <laughs> as black holes, which rotate around each other. And as they rotate, 
they lose energy through gravitational waves. And losing energy, they get closer and closer to each other until a point, very soon in the simulation here, when they merge and actually become one larger black hole. Then now it's settling down, so it settles down uh, in, in, in a stationary state, and in doing so emits gravitational waves. And those waves that were emitted in this, in this stage are precisely the ones observed by LIGO. Now, this is a nice uh, picture, and it, and it, a nice video, and it's actually like a real you know, simulation. Uh, but this, this kind of, of image, two black holes rotating, rotating around each other, is not what LIGO saw. Because we don't have anything, like, any, no, no telescope that is as powerful uh, to, to be able to see something like this. What LIGO actually saw is this. Okay, more, most precise, more, more precisely, the first line of the graph is the signal observed by the interferometer in Washington here on the left and in Louisiana on the right. And uh, you can see that there are two different signals. So the, the one in Washington is the, is the, red, the red signal, the one in Louisiana is the blue one. And you can see actually the, uh, the red one in Washington, it's also depicted on the right, shifted by precisely the time that the, the signal of the gravitational wave would have, uh, would have um, taken to travel from Washington to Louisiana. So you can see this is really the same signal observed by these two different interferometers. So from the signals so of this first line, well, you can probably see that there is something going on, right? There is an appearance of a wave like this peaks here. So you may see that there is something, but of course it seems very hard to know uh, where the signal comes from, if it comes from two black holes or any other, any other things, how big these black holes would be, how far away from Earth, how, how do we know all these things? Well, to understand and to actually be able to deduce all these properties, uh, what, what people at LIGO did was to perform thousands of computer simulations which produce, produce objects such as the second line. Those are called waveforms. There's, you see those are much smoother waves. And uh, those are um, the ones that are uh, simulated according to numerical relativity. So according really to the theory of general relativity, what would um, the, uh, the signal look like of, of the signal for a merger of some specific black holes at a certain distance of a certain mass, and what people at LIGO did was to compare the signal, so the first line, to the simulation, meaning the second line, which is the best fit. So find the best fit among all the thousands of simulations that they have, find the one that is the best fit. And so in this way, you, we, they were able to deduce all the information about the gravitational waves that were detected, so about the signal that they, could, that they observed in the first line. And the third line actually represents the difference between the signal and the simulation. So what, what, the, what, what physicists call the error. And here you can see one, one of those simulations from the SXS project where two black holes rotate around each other and the reciprocal oscillation produces gravitational waves. And here you see two polarization represented. And now this is a replay of the collision where the gravitational wave you can see reaches its peak. Now, also the Nobel Prize in Physics 2020, so three years after, was awarded to scientists, scientists studying black holes. And in particular, I'd like to mention the half of the prize that was given to Roger Penrose with the mention uh, uh, for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. And it's particularly uh, important for me because uh, for us, because uh, Roger Penrose has really always studied black holes from a mathematical point of view. And this was uh, one of the recognition of, of his work. And here is an image from one of Penrose papers in 1965, where he depicts the evolution here of some collapsing matter. Uh, as it evolves, you see the time direction is, is the vertical direction. So as, as this matter evolves with time, uh, he depicts this, um, this, uh, this behavior where this matter uh, collapses into a region uh, that contains a singularity here. And this region is uh, particularly interesting because not even light can escape from it. But we will come back to this picture later and try to see how 
how we arrive to such a picture, such a picture, in fact. But now what else? Are there any other proofs of the existence of black hole? Well, another direct proof of existence of black holes was this image. The first ever image produced of a black hole, the first image that we ever had. And this was obtained by the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a collaboration of thousands of people across the world who has been you know, so remarkably been able to effectively use the Earth, like the entire Earth, as a giant telescope to produce in April 2019 this image of M87, a supermassive black hole, as you know, far, uh, 55 million years away from us. And finally, just two months ago, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration again released this image. So this, this happened really uh, this past May. And this is the first image of the black hole in our own galaxy, which is Sagittarius A star. And just like the other, the other image, the image of, of M87 in 2019, you can see that the, also this black hole has a really marvelous ring of light around it, which may seem surprising for you know, something that's called the black hole. But we will come back to this later and see why and how is that. Okay, but this is a public lecture at the International Congress of, of Mathematicians. So it is fair to ask, well, what does mathematics have to do with these black holes? Okay, so they, have, they, they are interesting ob objects in physics. We have direct observations and a Nobel Prize in physics uh, given to people studying black holes. It's, it's really, it, there's a huge interest from the physics community for these objects. But, you know, why are we talking about them in an in a International Congress of Mathematicians? Well, there are lots, uh, lots of th there is there is a lot that mathematics ha has to say about black holes, and to understand really where all this begins, and so and what is the mathematics is really hidden behind these physical objects, so these black holes, we should actually go back to the Newtonian theory of gravity and try to see how that evolves into something like black holes. Well. What was the space-time according to Newton and Newtonian's theory? Well, in Newtonian theory, the space is three-dimensional and flat, and it's represented in this image by horizontal planes. Right? So these blue horizontal planes represents the space, our three-dimensional space that you know, is flat, uh, while here, uh, while then the time is actually an extra dimension. So again, the time is uh, as the vertical direction. And it's absolute, so it's the same at each point. So at each point in space, you can see there are these vertical lines that represent the passing of time. And this is uh, really uh, the, the essence of the Newtonian space-time. And even though Newtonian theory describes pretty well the you know, movement of celestial bodies and, and, and also movement of, of objects on Earth, really, there were some things back then already, you know, in the in the late in the late nineteenth uh, century and twentieth century, um, that they were known um, that didn't really work didn't really work out with the with Newtonian theory of gravity, such as the precession of Mercury's orbit was not was not able to explain using Newtonian theory of gravity. And so, in nineteen o five, Einstein Albert Einstein formulated this theory of special relativity. Well, in, in this theory, space and time are actually merged together into a four-dimensional object. So what he considers a four-dimensional flat space-time. And here, the spatial and temporal directions are not absolute anymore, but can actually vary. They can vary depending on the point in your space-time. As you can see here, the different spaces and different times can actually have some different directions. And moreover, Einstein realized with his special theory, with special relativity, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And, and for this reason, you can actually associate to each point of your space time what are called the light cones that are depicted here in red. So this, these cones describe really where light can travel. Light can travel along the edge of the cone and anything else 
cosmic massive object can only travel inside the cone. But let's give a closer look to the light cone. So this is a light cone. Centered at it is the observer. So let's say us or any 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 event, it can be centered and, and it's at its light cone. And the horizontal plane of, on this light cone is the hypersurface of the present. It corresponds to time equal to now for the observer. Now, as time passes along the vertical direction, in the, in the upward direction, this one that I'm indicating here is the future light cone. It's a cone that, that is towards the future of the observer. And on it, light rays can travel along the edge of the cone. Okay, so for example, if I am the observer, so I'm, I'm in, the, in, the, in the center of the cone, and I switch on a light here, then the photons, which are you know, particles of light, will travel along the edge of the cone. Okay, so they'll be able to travel along the edge. But on the other end, consider me, okay, that during this one hour lecture, okay, that it hits me. Now, since I'm sitting on this chair uh, during this time, I'm not moving much in space. So my trajectory would will mostly be vertical because the only way, the only direction I'm traveling in is really time. I'm not traveling along space. So my direction would be something like this in the light cone. And now all massive objects, anything else uh, in between me and light and it can travel you know, as, as, uh, as fast as light and you know, as low as me, we can actually, we'll move somewhere, we'll, we'll move somewhere in this uh, light cone. But while nothing, nothing at all according to special relativity can travel, is allowed to travel outside the cone. So this is how the light cone works. And the space-time of special relativity is called the Minkowski space-time. And so it's a flat, empty space containing all these vertical light cones all equal to each other. So just, you know, re remember just, uh, each cone represents the, uh, the directions where light can travel and any, anything, any massive object can travel inside the cone. So even though special relativity was, of course, a breakthrough in physics back then, it is, of course, very unsatisfactory if, if you think that, you no, know, this space-time is representing a space-time that is empty. So there is absolutely nothing at all in this space-time. It doesn't contain any mass, for example. Well, it is then natural to ask, for example, well, how would then the space-time look like if there was a mass in it, let's say a star? Well, in the subsequent 10 years after 1905, that's precisely the question that Albert Einstein answered. And Einstein formulated his theory of general relativity in late 1915, where he gave really a mathematical description of the space-time of a star. And here, first I'm gonna try to explain what is the geometrical picture of it. Well, the geometrical picture is the following. Now, if we imagine the space as being a flat grid, just like the ones you know, had before with all these light cones position on it, then uh, in the presence of a star, if we have a star in the picture, the star will not simply sit in the space, like appear in the space, but, but actually it's, it's just it's, its own presence would deform the space itself as it's depicted here in this, uh, in this image. So if in the absence of a star, so if there was no star, then an object was going, let's say a rocket was going to follow a straight line, then, then now with the star in the picture, the same object would still want to follow the straight line, but would actually be forced to bend towards the star because of the curved space caused by the presence of the star. It would then follow this curved line. Okay, so this is, the, this is the picture from the space point of view. But now what is the picture from the space-time point of view? Well, that's how the space-time of a star and its light points will look like. Now, let's uh, pause a minute. Why has the star become a cylinder? Well, because for each time, if you, if you take like, some given time, you will, you will create a section of this cylinder, which is a, a ball. Right, so and here we are depicting the star as, as a two-dimensional object because we don't know how to depict a four-dimensional, a four-dimensional object. So that's why we have a cylinder. For each time we have a ball, and as time passes, it creates a cylinder in space-time. 
Now, in the region far away from the sphere, the light cones are vertical, so pretty much, pretty much unchanged from the empty space time. But now, as they get closer to the star, you see the light cones start bending towards it, which in fact results in the bending of the trajectories in the previous picture. So if you are an observer, well, you can, of course, follow a trajectory that will lead you to hit the star, you know, and presumably die. But if you are smarter, from the same point, you can actually follow a path that lets you avoid the star. And you can always find such a path if you're outside the star. And we will see soon that this safe alternative, or not or, or no, getting away from the star, is not there if the, the picture is different in the case of black holes, in fact. But before going to black holes, so this is the kind of intuition about the space time of, of a star according to, to general relativity. But what is the actual mathematics behind this geometrical picture? Well, the space time of a star is a solution to the Einstein equation, which is the master equation of general relativity. In fact, according to general relativity, the space time is a four dimensional object with three special dimensions and one temporal dimension, which are not absolute, but they're still different, they are still different in nature, that satisfies the Einstein equation, which is written here. Now, this is the only formula that I've written in these slides, but it's a very important one. And I would say also a rather nice looking one. <laughs> and here is what it means. Well, the left hand side of the equation are somewhat involved quantities that encode how curved the space time is. Those are called Ricci curvature, scalar curvature of, of the magic G, as it's called. While on the right hand side, the quantity T is called the stress energy momentum tensor and it encodes all the information about the matter present in the universe. So, really, the Einstein equation describes the finely tuned interaction between curvature and matter, which can be summarized using the words of the American physicist John Wheeler, which says space time tells matter how to move and matter tells space time how to curve. And by the way, John Wheeler is also the person who actually gave the name of, to, of black holes to these objects. But see, even though uh, the Einstein equation looks quite simple to write, as it's written here in this one line, its difficulties are actually hidden in the definitions of those curvatures and the quantity t. And so in, moreover, the unknown of this equation is actually the geometrical description of the spacetime itself, that is denoted here as g, that it's called the metric, that appears on the left-hand side as, you know, in this hidden way, as a system of coupled partial differential equations which are you know, this, some complicated mathematical objects, whose behavior is determined by the matter contained in the universe on the right hand side. So, you see, this equation is, may seem easy to write, is actually not that easy. But actually, because of this involved character of the Einstein equation, contrary to Newtonian gravity, general relativity is not trivial even in the absence of matter. So, in fact, if you take T that vanishes completely, so t equal to zero, then the Einstein equation reduces to the Einstein vacuum equation written here. And here you can see Einstein writing his equation, the Ricci curvature equal to zero. And we will see that the vacuum case, so this is called the vacuum case, is already so rich and interesting from you know, both mathematical and physical point of view, in fact, having solutions such as black holes, then you know, in this talk, we will only discuss this case. So it is, there is lots of say, even in the, in the vacuum case, but now in, in general, in the case of general relativity, as opposed to special relativity. And now remember that we said that the space time of a star, according to general relativity, should be a solution to the Einstein equation. But what, what kind of solutions? Well, a star, you know, such as the sun in this, you know, in this picture from, from NASA, you see that uh, should be modeled in a certain sense by some self-gravitating fluid, uh, you know, the, 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 the red part in the sun, let's say in a, in a, in a ball of radius R0, right? So being the radius of, of our star, 
and surrounded by vacuum. So what's what's black here in this picture? For distances, so for distances from the center of the star, which are larger than R zero. And at first approximation, we can also thought the star as being spherically symmetric, because it, as you can see here, it's pretty much a sphere and static. So it doesn't it doesn't move in space uh, as much. And so with this kind of uh, ideas, so this self gravitating fluid surrounded by vacuum, which is spherically symmetric and static, these are precisely the, the properties of the first solution that has uh, been found of the Einstein equation. This was found by Carl Schwarzschild in 1916, just a few months after Einstein wrote his equation. And, and this is a presentation in, in space time. And so, so Schwarzschild found a solution of a self gravitating fluid in a ball of radius R0 in the, in the dark gray region here, surrounded by a vacuum solution outside, which is the light gray region. Okay. But now he found that the exterior solution depended on a factor of one over one minus two m over r, where m is the mass of the star and r is the distance from the origin, from the center of the star. But this poses a potential problem because you see, if the distance from the center of the star r here is equal to two m, then this factor would become would become two m over two m, so equal to one. So the denominator would become one minus one, so zero. So the entire fraction would be one over zero. And we know that this is forbidden by the laws, of, the laws of mathematics. We cannot divide by zero. So would this mean that this solution is only valid if R zero is larger than two M? But so, it, so let's say if you know the the radius of our star is actually larger than uh, than the radius equal to two M. Okay, but then what if the mass of the star, so this two M? becomes larger and larger, or its radius smaller and smaller by concentrating more matter in a smaller region of space, then this would move this r equal to m further and further away from the r equal r zero. And if this happens, if two m becomes larger than r zero, this could create problems by exposing the r equal to m case and therefore the division by zero in this fraction. So if the star concentrates more and more matter in a smaller region of space, such as passing from the, sun, from the sun to other astrophysical objects, such as white dwarf and neutral star, this could potentially happen. It could potentially expose the generation at r equal to m. And that the generation was believed to be a singularity of the gravitational field. Because it looked like the light cones here, as you approach the singularity r equal to m, will become thinner and thinner as, as they approach this r equal to m. And this kind of behavior was deemed to be unphysical by most people in the physics community. With people such as you know, Albert Einstein himself, writing 1939 in the prestigious uh, Annals of Mathematics uh, journal, that the essential result of this investigation is a clear understanding as to why the Schwarzschild singularities do not exist in physical reality. So people really didn't believe that such things could exist, that was only was only uh, some mathematical property, and here is really the first instance of when the mathematics has brought fundamental clarity to this problem. Because looking more carefully at the degeneration of the light cones that is depicted uh, here as as we approach R equal to m, and actually looking at them in a different way, technically by changing coordinates. Then Lemaitre realized that the light cones were not degenerate after all at R equal to m, but simply what happened is that they became tangent to it, allowing for a region between R equal zero and R equal to m with interesting geometrical properties. They took really long time, and especially you know, you know decades of, of mathematicians trying to actually understand what were what were those geometrical properties. And in fact, this is the complete picture of a collapsing star. And it may remind you of the figure drawn by Penrose in his paper, okay? But let's look at this picture more closely. Well, away from the collapsing matter, the light cones appear just as before, vertical far away, and then bend towards it as they get closer. Okay, nevertheless, if the collapsing matter gets concentrated in a region smaller than 2M, 
then the, the generation, what, what seemed to be the generation is now exposed. But what, what, what happens is that those light cones become tangent to this r equal to m, which is called the event horizon. So if you are an observer outside the event horizon, you can follow any unmissable trajectory inside the light cones and get away, precisely like you were doing before outside a star. But now if you're not careful and you happen to cross the event horizon, like this, the, the spider here, well then by being allowed to travel only inside the light cone, remember, so that's the general rule, you're forced to remain inside the region r smaller than 2m and eventually hit the singularity, you know, again, presumably die. And, you know, even if you try to send light from me, so you're trying to, to ask for help, right? Send, send signal, uh, say, you know, help me, I, uh, I, I don't know, I'm stuck here. Well, if you're trying to send light, well, the light will travel along the edges of the cone. So again, it will not be able to get away from the event horizon. It will not be able to get out of this region. So the region inside the event horizon, so this region here, where not even light can escape, is called the black hole region. And now here, uh, of course, we see that a region where not even light can escape is very counterintuitive. And you know, physicists back then, especially, really did not believe it could exist. After all, the Schwarzschild black hole, you know, is just a mathematical solution, which you know, moreover is spherically symmetric, you know, is static, uh, and we know that, for example, in nature, nothing is so symmetric. Nothing, nothing is perfectly a sphere, right? So for this reason, physicists really have believed for decades that the black hole region was an artifact of symmetry that was appearing in the mathematical construction of this object, but not in the real world because you no, know, it didn't make sense, right? So this well, that's what people believed for decades until in 1963, Roy Kerr found a rotating solution to the Einstein equation that you can see here in this simulation by the SXS project. But this rotating solution still contained a black hole region. And the Kerr solution really generalizes the Schwarzschild solution as it's now rotating around an axis, which is a much more realistic property uh, for an astrophysical object. And this was a game changer for black holes. Because after this solution was found, people start believing that black holes could exist in the real world. And in fact, the golden age of you know, study of black holes by people such as Stephen Hawking, Roger Penrose, John Wheeler was actually getting started really with this, with this, um, with, with, with this solution. But again, this is still uh, a mathematical solution though. So how do we know, you know if these mathematical solutions actually represent physical black holes, which are you know, out there in the sky. Well, the Kerr black hole, even though it rotates around its axis, it does all, always in the same way as time passes by. So it's, we say it's independent of time or it's a stationary solution. And in, in particular, we, this means that it's a, the Kerr solution is a point of equilibrium for the Einstein equation, as it does not depend on time. So here, I want to draw an analogy with an, an object that, you know, hopefully it's more, it's more common, you know, than black holes, that also has point of equilibrium, which is the pendulum. Okay, so the pendulum has two points of equilibrium, the position downward and the position upward. Okay, so if you could position your pendulum in exactly, precisely those two positions, then the pendulum would remain still, would not move for all times. It would just stay there forever. Okay, but there is a huge difference though between these two positions. So in the first case, when the pendulum is downward, if you happen to perturb it slightly, then the pendulum will oscillate around the point of equilibrium. And eventually, you know, if there's some dissipation, it will eventually come back to it oscillates and come back to the, to the downward position. On the other hand, if you slightly move the pendulum away from its upward position, well, the pendulum will actually fall down and never come back to its point of equilibrium. It will actually you know, oscillate uh, its, its, its way out 
and uh, will then uh, eventually go back to the downward position. Okay, so we say that the first position is stable while the second is unstable. Okay, and I don't know about you, but I've never seen a pendulum upward in, uh, in my life, in, in the real world. And the reason is that the point, that point of equilibrium is unstable and therefore it's unphysical. So uh, these are really, what, what is unphysical is really, is not, not that the generation such as they are equal to M, which was understood from a mathematical point of view, but what is unstable and so if, if perturbs lightly completely changes its, its properties, is what is unphysical, what, what can never be observed in the real world. So in order to represent physical black holes, the Kerr solution has to be stable to perturbations. And we can now formulate then one important conjecture in general relativity, which is the stability of the Kerr solution that says that the Kerr black hole is a stable point of equilibrium for the Einstein equation. So this means that if a Kerr black hole with a certain mass rotation gets perturbed, then just like the pendulum downward, after some time, will go back being a Kerr black hole with possibly a different mass and rotation. Because hey, so you may now wonder, how does this happen? Well, what makes now the perturbation go away? Is there an oscillation like in the case of the pendulum? What is the, what is the behavior there? Well, to answer this question, we need to understand what describes the dynamics of black holes. And here, mathematics has once again crucially enlightened the way. In fact, in our seminal work in 1952, Yvonne Choquebrois, a uh, mathematician Yvonne Choquebrois, proved that solutions to the Einstein equation propagate as waves. And with it, she effectively started the field of mathematical general relativity. Okay, so, but what does it mean to propagate as waves? Okay, so if I say waves, you probably think about water waves, okay, such as the ones created by a stone falling in a pond, which co creates concentric ripples around it. So if, if, if we want to give an animated, so this, this is a picture, but if we want to give an animated representation of those waves would be like this, circles that propagate uh, outward as time passes. If now we want to represent those waves in a space-time diagram with the usual time direction, which is vertical, now we will have these circles that propagate something, something like this. As time passes, they become larger, and so they propagate in this way. Well, according to Shokebrua's theorem, solutions to the Einstein equation propagate in a similar way uh, as this. So starting from an initial condition, uh, which is represented by this by this um, purple circle, and propagating in space time with some finite speed as a wave. Okay, so then if the stability of the Kerr solution is true, just like the water waves in a pond propagate away through ripples in the water, and then become smaller and smaller as time passes. In the same way, the perturbations of a Kerr black hole should dissipate away, leaving behind simply another black hole. So you, you, may, you may wonder, well, that's surely what happens, right? What else can, could happen? Well, something very different could happen. Like, for example, if the waves resonate with each other and get amplified, instead of being dissipated. So it's when, it, for example, as it can happen when you have resonances on bridges, Right, and make them oscillate tremendously. So you could have both behavior. What, what, what is the real, what is the behavior that happens in the case of black holes? Well, to investigate what happens, we can start by looking at a simpler case, meaning of waves in a fixed care black hole. So this is the picture. Outside the black hole, at a certain time here, represented in red, imagine to have some perturbation, just like the stone in the pond. Okay, so it could be an electromagnetic radiation, a particle, anything. Then this will propagate as a wave as represented here. Some of it will fall into, into the black hole, some will disperse away. But the question is what happens to the bulk of the radiation? Will this dissipate away or will some of it concentrate and create an accumulation of energy like, to, like resonances? Well, there is something very worrisome in this sense 
is that outside the event horizon, there is a sphere called the photosphere where light can actually get stuck. And light rays can be trapped there without neither falling to the black hole nor dissipate away. So you may really worry that this would cause a concentration of energy, making the Kerr black hole unstable. But in fact, this does not happen because those trapped photons are unstable themselves. So you can see in this video, as light approaches the black hole, it gets closer to the photosphere starting orbiting around it. And the number n that you see, n equal one, n equal two, uh, is the number of times the light rotates around the black hole. So light approaches the photosphere, as you can see in this video now, but as it is unstable, it actually gets scattered away after some time. And so no concentration of energy can happen because this photosphere is unstable. And moreover, the photons which rotate around the black hole of the photospheres and then dissipate away, as you can see here, are precisely the photons that travel the long distance and reach the event horizon telescope and they make the luminous ring outside the black hole that we see in that image. And so this property of unstable trapped of uh, the photosphere is just one of many properties of the Kerr black hole that were used by the Fermos, Ronyansky, Schwab, and Tokrotman in 2013 to prove that waves outside the Kerr black hole do not concentrate energy, but in, indeed disperse away, even in fast rotating black holes. And now we now consider the case of not just waves on a fixed Kerr black hole, but rather gravitational waves for the Einstein equation. So for now, we look at waves on a given black hole and see they do not concentrate energy. But the full conjecture of the black hole stability actually concerns solutions to the Einstein equation. So in particular, this means that the perturbation, this perturbation that starts here, will actually change the black hole itself. So we'll, we'll change the, we'll, we'll cause to change you know, the, the horizon, the singularity, the the um, the photosphere, the light cones in themselves, it will change the, the, the ambient space where the perturbation happens to be. And this is what physicists call a back reaction to the perturbation. And this property is what mathematicians call the nonlinearity of the problem. And the nonlinearity makes the whole difference, even in the empty Minkowski space. So you see the full problem for Minkowski space is then the following. Consider an initial time in Minkowski space by this red plane. There you have in particular in this, in this initial time, all the properties of Minkowski space, which, which, which all true, so the light cones and so on. And now what you, what you want to do, you want to forget that you are in the full empty space, but only remember the properties in your initial time. Forget where it came from, but now you only know your initial, the properties of Minkowski space in your initial time. And now to those properties, you perform a perturbation. Okay, it's represented here as a red circle. So if, you're, if you had vertical light cones, imagine to perturb them a little bit, but only in the initial time. And now this perturbation will propagate away as waves. And from them, you can deduce, for example, the shape and position of the light cones that is caused by this perturbation. When now proving that Minkowski space is stable would then mean to prove that after long enough time, the light cones will be back being precisely like the ones in the empty space we started with. Okay, And the stability of Minkowski space was proved in 1993 by Christodoulou Kleinerman in a book of more than 500 pages which was, you know, which is another great example of mathematical enlightenment in general relativity. And in fact, like Shokebrua's theorem uh, started the field of mathematical general relativity, the uh, work of Christodoulou Kleinemann really was the first in a long path of problems surrounding the conjecture of stability of, uh, of the Kerr black holes. There are you know, lots of people and contributing at many different stages that I don't really have time to describe, but it really took more than 30 years and many, many results by many people. Again, I want to stress that to extend the proof of the stability of Minkowski space to the case of black holes. For the Schwarzschild black hole solutions by the Fermos, Olsegger, and Asky Taylor last year, and for the slowly rotating pair black holes uh, case in a joint work with Kleinemann Scheftel this year. 
So those are very long you know, and quite intricate proofs. But I will now try uh, my best to give you an idea of the proof in three slides. Okay, so bear with me for another second. Okay, so the overall setup of the proof is a proof by contradiction. Now, remember our perturbation of the black hole, this picture. We want to show that the perturbation will become smaller and smaller and eventually disappear altogether, leaving behind a black hole defined for all future times, okay, defined for all times. Now, to prove that, we assume by contradiction that the perturbation does not become small, but actually there is a point where it becomes so strong that the perturbed solutions to the Einstein equation is so altered that it stops to exist after some time, which is the maximum time of existence. We then use our mathematical machinery to prove that actually the perturbation is not so strong and the solution can be extended past that time, as you see here. But this is a contradiction, it's a contradiction as that was assumed to be the maximal time of existence. And so the fact that the perturbation is strong is falsified and the perturbed solution exists for all times in the proof of contradiction argument. So really, what is this mathematical machinery then that we use so crucially? Well, the Einstein equation is what is called a tensorial equation, which means it is an equation which can be studied in an infinite number of ways. And those ways are called gauge. So as part of the Einstein equation, there are quantities which are less dependent on how we study it, and those are called gauge invariant. And those quantities represent really the physical reality of the problem. And in these proofs, the control of the gauge invariant quantities is used to deduce control on quantities which depend on the gauge, called gauge dependent quantities, through a careful choice of gauge among these infinite possibilities that we have. And now we'll try, just you know, to end, to give uh, an explanation of what gauge invariant, gauge dependent choice of gauge means in a much simpler example. Hopefully, it's also more fun, such as. A balloon in a room. Okay, let's 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 suppose that we have a balloon in a room, and suppose now that I want to tell you where the balloon is. Okay, now the position of the balloon is the physical reality that I want to share with you, and in fact, so this will be, for example, you know, some gravitational waves around the black hole. It's, it's a, the physical reality that I want to to describe, I want to study. But so this is what I want to share, but I can do that. I can tell you where the balloon is in many different ways, okay? So I can tell you that the balloon is one meter away from the floor, one meter from the left wall and one meter from the back wall. Or I could also tell you that the balloon is two meters from the ceiling, three meters away from the right wall and one meter away from the back wall. Okay, so uh, even though these two sets of number, so one, one, one and three to one, are very different, uh, have very different sets of numbers. They are describing the same physical reality, the position of the balloon. And that's, and that's you know, the, the important things, the physical reality. But I, I still have to choose one way or another. And now let's say that I choose to give you the blue measurement. And, and now the balloon moves in the room. And I will have to give you, uh, after it has moved, Again, the measurement with the same uh, description, the same blue measurement, to describe again its position. Okay, so here in this in this example, the balloon is the gauge invariant quantity. The position of the balloon, the physical reality, it's the gravitational wave. The blue measurement measurement is our choice of gauge, and you know this this proves they they use very different they can use different choice of gauges, which is which can be quite complicated. Uh, it, but in this case, it would be the, you know, the blue measurement. And, and now the actual measurement, so the length of you know, the distance from you know, the, the wall that I decided to give you is the gauge dependent quantity. So it's very much related to the, the choice of gauge. But now in, in this kind of proofs, so those are nonlinear problems, uh, with, you know, it involves a system of partial differential equations. What you should think, you should, you should think that, you know, these balloons as it moves, it actually changes the room itself. It changes the, the, the blue measurement. It changes the ruler to measure it. 
So everything is, is, is connected and you have to pick up you know, a good gauge in order to control the gauge dependent quantities from the gauge environment, everything is connected all together. That's why those are very long uh, um, uh, proofs that uh, involve uh, this, 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 kind of, this kind of theorems. And with this, I really would like to conclude my lecture where I hoped I give you a sense on uh, how mathematics has enlightened the history of black holes, not just like uh, this, this, this galaxy that is passing through this black hole. And you know, from the very beginning of, of, the, of the history of black holes, is continuing to do so with recent results. And I will bet here they will continue to do so for a very long time. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eleanor, for such a wonderful talk. It's just amazing. You can perhaps clap. I can clap, I'm unmuted. Um, if you have any questions, please can you put them in the chat? And what is, what is amazing about the images that you've shown, both the um, LIGO, LIGO Virgo results, and the um, image, the, the Einstein telescope results, is that we can learn now so much about the properties of black holes. Um, I guess I've always thought them to be stable, to be honest, but, um, you know, we can learn now, not just the, um, the you know, the, the event horizon as we predicted, it's there, we can see it. And it's just amazing. I don't know how much further we can go in this quest. Um, yeah, indeed. <laughs> ah, we've got some. Got some questions. So we've got um, Carol Cursus Rose, who's asking how you came to work on this area. I don't know, Carol, if you'd like to ask your question by unmuting yourself and just saying it and showing us who you are, or otherwise. Hello. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wondered out, out of all the many different areas that there are, how did you come to get interested in this? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess the way I I got to it is um, is there are like do like two um, two different uh, reasons. One was that I've always been very interested in uh, in physics as well as in mathematics. You know, since you know high school. Uh, and and so when I decided that I would actually want to become a mathematician, I I was never ready to really give up on the physics, uh, and so I, I that that it was natural I was naturally interested in the you know physical aspects too, and then you know the from the mathematics uh, really point of view the the part of mathematics I liked the most was really what is called differential geometry, which is you know a field of mathematics that has um, that has to do with ge geometry, but also and and uh, also like analytical aspects of uh, geometrical objects, and so. Um, it's really, it's really very natural that the, the, the area of mathematical physics, so mathematics and physics um, together, which uh, uses a lot of differential geometry, is really general relativity. So that's how you know, my, my interest in physics and differential geometry kind of got together into, into the interest of general relativity, which you know, started, I guess, at the beginning of my PhD mostly. Okay, uh, we have another question from um, Pietro. Fum Agali, could you better explain the concept of maximal time? I don't know if you, you know if you want to say anything more, uh, Pietro. Yes, in the uh, in the explanation of the demonstration, you talked about the maximal time, but actually, what is it? Yes. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for pointing it out. So uh, really, by maximal time, I simply means I simply mean the uh, the, the the time. Uh, so I said this, it's a perfect contradiction. So I assume that there is a maximal time. So there is a time uh, that is you know the, the largest possible time uh, after which the solution does not exist anymore. After which the perturbation. Uh, I, I you know we assume by contradiction that the perturbation becomes so large. That it doesn't that the, the whole solution cannot exist after that 
maximal time. So it's really it's really the largest possible time you can take. So that's why it's a, it's a contradiction because after you use that mathematical machinery, uh, you you actually show that you can extend uh, you can extend the solution past that time. And so, well, then it means at the end of the day, it was not maximal. It was not the largest possible time. So then that contradicts your, your original assumption. But it would have a, a, physical, uh, a physical meaning or it's just a mathematical no. concept? No, it's a mathematical. I mean, if, if, it was, if it was not a contradiction, so if, it, if it, it was really then, if you could prove that that's a maximal time, then it would have a physical meaning. For example, it would, mean, it would be the time where you know, something, some singularities develop something something uh, some concentration of energy happens and you know there is some sort of explosion if you want in a certain sense in, in your in your space time but since you're proving you're actually using for as a contradiction you're proving that that yeah, at the end of the day you'll prove that that does not exist so uh, it doesn't have a physical um a physical meaning in that case thank you sure. we have another question from marwan uh, bashim uh, what is the source of the noise in the data from LIGO? I don't oh, know. Yeah, there is the so of course I'm not an expert in there. I mean, you know, that's uh, more from the, from the experimental physics point of view. But I can I I know you know I can tell you that there are lots of noises that you know for for LIGO, uh, for you know, LIGO interferometers. You know, really from anything such as you know you're, you're trying to measure you know you're trying to measure you know the deformation of space time you know inside of space time. so you can imagine how how much noise you can have like you know all possible uh any movement of the earth any any even like you know a car that passing by you know next to the light interferometers would, would create some noise so it's it's extremely it, they it's a huge you know uh, uh um problem to actually fix and I solve uh, and, and try to minimize all these noises. But what I meant in the maybe what you're referring to in, in the slides when I was showing the signal and the and the the waveform um, uh, obtained through numerical relativity and then the, the the difference between them you will have this error that is really you should you should think of it as 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 it should be something that is sort of a random distribution. So if you subtract your signal you subtract your, your model from the signal, you should not have any theoretical uh, information contained in it anymore. So it's something that it's sort of, it's a random uh, kind of, uh, kind of um, uh, wave that, that hands up, um, that, that, you, that you end up having with this difference. But you know that the actual noise can be, can, can come from many different sources. Um, is that okay? Probably. Um, uh, Mahesh Krishna is asking what the connection between black holes and the Higgs boson. Uh, yeah, okay. So the here again, um, uh, the Higgs boson is uh, it's yeah it's 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 really it's something that has um, doesn't really live in the realm of the classical general relativity. It lives in the, in the realm of, in in the in the um, comes from like quantum mechanics, you know, quantum uh, theory of gravity, if you want. So there is a connection, meaning that you know, if you're in 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 physics, people want to. Uh, want to find you know, the, the full you know, the theory of gravity that in, incorporates general relativity and quantum mechanics, and there you know they, they would have some interactions, but it's really not in um, in a classical general relativity or in a mathematical general relativity that I described here. So I'm not really I'm not much help in this question. <laughs> um, Ocean Kim. Uh, in modern mathematical work regarding stability of solutions to Einstein equations, would you say the bulk of the work is primarily geometric or function analytic in flavor? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good question. Uh, it's um, so I, I would say, so um, uh, I don't know precisely what you mean by function analytic, but I would say it's mostly uh, analytic. I mean, it's, it, there is lots of uh, analysis by, you know, what mathematicians call uh, analysis as, uh, for, uh, for example, the analysis of partial different solutions to partial differential equations. They're probably, they have a like, larger role in the modern mathematical works uh, as opposed to geometrical, um, geometrical uh, properties in, in this kind of pro problems that I, that I described, because, um, 
as I, uh, as I, you know, when I, when I talked about, you know, the, this, this theorem by Schoeke-Bra, really the, the interpretation of generativity is through an initial value problem, what, what we call initial value problem. So by giving some initial condition and, and trying to understand what happens after, what happens in the future of this uh, initial condition. So that's why, and, and in those kind of problems is really the analysis um, the, the analysis uh, of, of, of the solutions of these equations is crucial. It's maybe more important than sometimes some, the, the geometrical aspects. So uh, in this sense, I would say the analytic, um, the analytic part is probably has more uh, applications here. Um, does that answer your question, Oshim? Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot, yeah. Okay. Ah. So Jonathan Wallace has a question. Um, mm -hmm. In some slide, you showed the light cones thinning as they approach the event horizon, I think. Are the light cones unique for each black hole? That, that's, a, that's also a very, very good, very, very good question as it's posed because um, the, uh, in a certain sense, yes, the light cones are unique for each uh, solution, uh, for each black hole solution because the light cones really encode the geometry in a certain sense of your, of your black hole. So if you have two different black holes, which are really two different solutions to the, the, the Einstein equation, like, like poor, truly different solutions, then also the light cones will be, will, will, will be different. So what I described you know, in those, in those um, images were really like you know, the general overall behavior. So if you, if you have two different black holes and we have different mass, different uh, rotation and so on, they, you know they they will have um, different light cones, uh, but the overall behavior that I described, for example, that the light cone become tangent to this event horizon, or they start bending towards it be, uh, outside it, the, the overall behavior will be the same. But the actual um, you know, position, if you want, the, the position of the light cones uh, surely will be will be uh, different um, for different solutions to the Einstein equation. Thank you. Um, are there, there's no more questions in the chat. Is there anyone else wanting a quick question? So this is the second of the three public lectures that LMS are hosting of the um, virtual ICM public lectures. The next one is, by, is on the 13th of July by Tadashi Tokida of Stanford. And his lecture has the very intriguing title, A World from a Sheet of Paper. Um, the full details are on the LMS website, and you're very welcome to join that one. And before we go, please may I ask you to thank Eleanor Giorgio for such an amazing lecture. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you very much for coming. And we can now close the ICM public lecture. <laughs>